Um, there's been uh, a few questions around the background for people here, whether you're a machine learning engineer, data scientist. Um, how many here are excited about uh, Kubernetes? Deploy to Kubernetes? Are interested in CRDs? Great. So um, I, I, this will be a little bit sort of separate from the previous conversations. Uh, the previous speakers have done a great job uh, talking about Kubeflow, why to get involved, why it exists. Um, I'll, I'll re-emphasize some of those messages, but then I'll also dive into some of the, um, the things that Kubeflow uses to actually build and develop and deploy as an application to be Kubernetes native. All right, um, so Kubeflow is, as Jeremy mentioned, composable, portable, scalable. This is the scale conference. But it's also Kubernetes native, and we'll dive into that a little bit, uh, extensive, uh, extensible, and open. Um, and I think each one of these three things hopefully will give you further motivation to uh, get involved in the community, as well as it'll make you a better um, partner if you're in a relationship, or if you're single, it'll give you better dating mojo. Guaranteed. Just seeing if people are paying attention. All right, um, so you saw this, uh, Jeremy mentioned this already, people get involved in um, AI, machine learning, thinking they're going to spend all their time on the, the code, but in reality, where they spend their time is all this other stuff to make it happen. And, um, and that, in part of that uh, article there, the hidden technical debt. So you do this work, uh, and get to do all this other supporting work to, to sort of make it a reality, which, why is that a problem? Well, uh, you could lose a lot of money. So in that same article, I'll talk about one organization that lost half a billion dollars in 45 minutes. Holy crap, that's pretty bad. And so they, they said as part of that, it was dead experimental code paths. Well, how hard can it be to find dead experimental code paths? Well, if on that previous slide, you saw your code and all the other stuff, if it looked a little bit like this, you know, try and find the, the dead, non-working cable in this, in this mess, right? In reality, what you want is something like that. And that's where Kubeflow comes in, is it helps you build systems and scalable systems that look a little bit more like this. You could argue that you still couldn't find the dead cable path in this, but at least it'd be maybe easier and, and less onerous to actually read through all of the different uh, cables in there. So, that's kind of part of the motivation. Um, back to these three simple messages. Qflow is Kubernetes native, extensible, and open. You'll see that a couple more times. So what does it mean to be Kubernetes native? So here's a, a general architecture for Kubernetes. Um, you guys have probably seen this a thousand times. You've got a master node, worker nodes, a bunch of things in there that'll uh, schedule your containers. You have an OCI repo or your uh, Docker repo that'll serve up the images. I haven't put in here the fact that you know somebody's actually built some code and had a Docker file and, and created that container. Um, thanks for that. Um, and put it into the, the repo, but uh, that's kind of a, a general architecture. Uh, to level set a little bit, uh, what, what is Kubernetes? So in here you can see, you can probably read faster than I can talk about, but you got nodes and they run pods. Pods created and managed by replica sets. You can do some of these things without, like replica sets, without deployments. But in a, in a second, you'll see how those things help facilitate and help manage your workloads and help make running containers and keeping containers running happy. So that's some of the terms that I might use throughout. And eventually, we'll talk about the APIs, what they are, why they're important, and then get into some CRDs, which is you know, custom resource definitions, which Kubeflow and other Kubernetes native applications make heavy use of. Um, to re-emphasize a little bit more on Kubernetes APIs, you can sort of double click on each one of these and sort of have a, a pretty good conversation around what does it mean to be declarative as opposed to imperative? What does it mean to be asynchronous, level-driven, observable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I'll dive into the declarative one and the extensible one. And again, this is just so to reemphasize uh, this, this transformation that you're seeing within the um, community, software development, application development, corporate applications, going from whether it's monolith to, to um, microservices, but essentially going into the cloud native world and quite possibly, presumably, the Kubernetes 
native world and how you can take advantage um, of Kubernetes to help accelerate your application development, help you get involved in Kubeflow and understand how Kubeflow is created. All right, so let's go into a, a deployment example and see what happens. So you have a YAML file and uh, you'll see a lot of YAML files um, as part of uh, Kubeflow. You don't, we're, we're, we, you may or may not get involved with these YAML files, but uh, it'll be good for you to sort of embrace it, love it, uh, understand what they are. The first two lines there is just sort of the, 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 the resource metadata. The, the next part there, we actually use specific metadata, is that object metadata, and then you get into a spec. And you'll see that uh, a little bit later, I'll show you an example of a TensorFlow job spec. Similar, but different. And so what happens is uh, when you say sort of kubectl apply to that YAML file, um, first what will happen is it'll discover the endpoints for the API server, it'll do an HTTP post, and then magically, I put question mark there, because magically all these pods just sort of appear on worker nodes somewhere in the world. Now how does that happen? Well, here's a little bit more of a detailed view on what happens. So you hit the apply button on, on deploy, it hits the API server, says create, um, that will send a watcher event to the controller, the deployment controller. What it'll do is it'll sort of say, hey, you know, I'm going to go create a replica set. And I'm just going to click through the rest of this because what you'll see is that each of these different controllers are looking for certain events to happen and they'll get notified of an event. And when that event happens, they can do whatever they want. In this particular scenario, they're creating additional resources, which will then cause additional work to happen. So there we'll see the replica set controller doing its job, pod scheduler doing its job, the node doing its job, and those last two there, the update pods, that's actually updating the status of a pod resource that is being maintained by Kubernetes. So that's, that's the end of that discussion there where I was trying to tease out is, you know, what happens uh, with uh, a YAML file, a resource definition, what happens with controllers, now we're just going to go to fast forward into um, a TF job CRD. Uh, can you guys read that one on the left? Awesome. Um, so that's a four point font, but that's to give you an example of, of defining a TensorFlow job and that one that you can submit. There's a bunch of arguments in there. I'm not going to go all over all of them. If I went over, no, I can't do that easily, can I? Um, I was gonna show our, our wonderful documentation and let's see if I go up there, here. So here you can see that this is um, up on our site, uh, qflow.org and docs. You'll see uh, TensorFlow training. What is a TF job? This is that in, in better print. Uh, you can see how you can pass in arguments and, you, and by defining this YAML file, you can use kubectl to then send this in and, and have all that training happening, have all that magic happen. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting part of this, not only to show how Kubeflow works, but uh, if you have other corporate applications that you're in the process of uh, transforming into Kubernetes, then Kubeflow provides a really, really good example of how to do some Kubernetes native stuff and some best practices to take advantage of what it has to offer as a platform. Um, and then this will go into all of the detail here, so you haven't, I don't think we've actually shown this uh, this uh, website yet, but uh, please uh, go to qflow.org. Uh, lots of great documentation in there. And again, this is uh, specifically how TF job works. And as Jeremy showed in one of his slides, there's a lot of boxes in the architecture. There's a lot of components that are part of Kubeflow. Um, too, not enough time here today to go into each one of those, um, but um, I'll go back to my presentation here. Okay, so why is this important? So here's the, your general training uh, process. You've seen some examples of this already. Defining the model, training it, having a trained model, deploying it, whether it's a private cloud, public cloud, you know, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, remember back to seeing all those crazy cables in your data center. Um, so you can start on a workstation. So Kubeflow, and you have CPU, GPU storage, et cetera. But now imagine that you have uh, a single cluster, but multiple deployments of Kubeflow. 
It could be per namespace. So imagine each one of these belongs to an individual user, and you're doing shared resources across the bottom. Now take that out to imagine you have not only a single cluster, but you have multiple clusters, multiple Kubernetes clusters, either on-prem, VMware, bare metal, up in the public cloud, and you want to define and you want to deploy quite, quite possibly not only this many Kubeflow deployments, but also your corporate applications, leveraging the exact same hardware. So if you want to think about resource utilization, CPU utilization, et cetera, et cetera, doing not only your artificial intelligence on that same hardware, but then also your corporate applications on the same hardware, then that's when you start to see that understanding uh, the power of Kubeflow, but then also uh, being able to use Kubernetes and define CRDs to define your own resources and interact with that with an API. I know that uh, earlier there was a lot of DevOps, a lot of hands went up. So you can, you can search this tree of information, this tree of resources, quite easily once you understand what that looks like and how to start surfing um, uh, these clusters. All right, so you saw some of these components already. I won't go into some of these details. There's more and more uh, being added all the time. Um, I actually don't even think I put up here ModelDB. Uh, ModelDB's been there for quite some time. It's from a community out there in MIT. Quite interesting, it's not a CRD, it's a service. Um, but it's an example of uh, this community, a growing community, how you can easily add um, your own component and then to integrate with that component within your machine learning jobs, just sort of it's a simple sort of addition or modification of some of your code to then integrate with some of these services. A lot of key components, these are on Jeremy's slides as well, so I won't go into the details. Um, I'll skip that slide. And then, um, yeah, it's extensible. So add your own Jupyter containers, your own controllers, your own pipeline components. You build your own standard pipelines. Um, come up with your own innovation. So there's lots of ways that you can get involved and you can extend Kubeflow and make it available to your organization. Um, and particularly if you're a platform engineer responsible for providing a platform to your organization, these are some of the areas where you can play in. And lastly, I, I flew in from Australia this morning, uh, so that's why I might be a little bit sleepy. But that's what open roads look like in Australia. I don't see any dead kangaroos, but a lot of times you'll see dead kangaroos as well. It's a different story. Um, but the community is very open. So, um, uh, you know, if, if you haven't gotten involved yet, uh, please get involved. Um, if you are an innovator, um, there's lots of uh, different platforms you can use to innovate. Uh, I work for Canonical and Ubuntu, and it's real easy to get uh, going on Ubuntu and Ubuntu platform. We have a lot of tools to get you going. That's it. Sure. Sure, sure. So um, uh, CDK, uh, Canonical Distribution of Kubernetes, or Charm Distribution of Kubernetes. Um, there will be a charmed version of uh, Kubeflow. You'll see an example of that later today. Any other questions? All right. Be back at 1.30.